Good evening, everybody. My name is Mario Testaverde. I'm a senior economist with the World Bank based in Washington, D.C. Try to speak loud. They don't hear you. Is it okay now? No. Okay. Maybe you're Okay. And what about the others? Test, test? Yes. Okay. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, yeah. let's start from the beginning. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mario Testaverde. I'm a senior economist with the World Bank based in Washington, D.C. And I know that this session comes at the end of a long day and we stand between uh, dinner and, uh, uh, <laughs> and the end of the, uh, of the forum. So thanks for joining. We're going to make the, uh, the session very interesting with this panel, starting with Minister Caridis, the Minister of Migration and Asylum in Greece, and then um, Mr. Alexander Fauché, um, I hope I pronounce it correctly, the um, expert of foreign affairs in the, Polish, um, parla in the Polish Parliament, a member of the Polish Senate between 2011 and 2023. We also have Mr. Pablo Acosta, global lead at the World Bank, uh, focused on migration based in Washington, D.C. And Mr. Fabio Jimenez, head of the Labor Mobility and Markets Unit at the International Organization for Migration. So we're going to keep talking about migration after the um, panel just before us, because we also want to uh, say something about how origin countries and destination countries can coordinate to achieve better objectives, better outcomes um, for migration. And before starting talking with the panelists, I just would like to give you some number to put things into context. So migration is central for uh, social economic life in Europe. And just to, just to give you an idea, at the moment, six million vacancies go unfilled in Europe, meaning that there, is, there are very severe shortages. But looking at the next two decades, these shortages will be as many as 60 million. The population of my own country, Italy. At the, at the same time, when we look at the Global South, we know that in the next 10 years, the 1.2 billion people will enter the labor, out of the 1.2 billion people entering the labor market, one third of them, so 400 million, will not have jobs for them based on the current trajectory. So migration can really be a solution to address human, capi human capital mismatches around the world. And so during this panel, we want to understand how migration policies can really be a solution to that. And maybe briefly, the, this, year is part, this uh, period is particularly important <coughs> because given the shortages and given the uh, severity of the issue, the World Bank in 2023 launched a report, the World Development Report, our annual flagship publication focused on migrants, refugees, and society. And this is a milestone for our organization, and I'm sure that my colleague Pablo will tell more about this. But, Let's start the discussion with the, with the panelists. And since we are in Greece, we, uh, in this fantastic historical site of Delphi, we'd like to start with you, uh, we start with you Mr. Caridis. So we know that based on what I said before, Greece is really no exception to the trends the labor market are experiencing. We know that the share of the working age population is decreasing, is now at around 60%, maybe uh, a bit more. But over the next decades, the share of the working age population is going to decrease. The de all dependency ratio, at the moment around 35%, is projected to become 60% by 2050. And as we know, there are labor shortages, traditionally in the agriculture sector, but now more recently also in IT, manufacturing, in the hospitality sector, that are um, affecting the country. So we heard in the previous panel that the government has introduced uh, several measures to try to address these shortages. And you talk about bilateral agreements with Armenia, with uh, Bangladesh, with India. So we would like to understand a bit more in your experience how this coordination with origin countries can really lead to better outcomes. And also what are the challenges of entering these agreements, but at the same time, what opportunities you have seen by doing so uh, with these countries. So over to you, Mr. Caridis. First of all, I find it fascinating the way an economist talks about migration <laughs> and about the mismatches and how we need to match the mismatch. The problem always is, as you very well know, 
is that politics intervene in these uh, mismatches and makes uh, 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 matching the mismatch so much more difficult, right? right. If only it were a symbol as uh, um, having the deficit from the one side and the surplus of labor on the, on the other and just uh, uh, combine the, 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 the two. The story is so much complica more complicated. And for us, I will speak in a moment about my friend Alexander, for, for, for us in the uh, middle of the political spectrum, uh, who uh, understand uh, uh, the economic uh, benefits, but also need to be elected, uh, is a constant struggle to make the argument and uh, not uh, uh, leave uh, room to uh, the populist demagogues uh, uh, to usurp it. And uh, I'm not sure it is a winning battle in uh, Europe uh, right now. We have done uh, better in Greece. We have recently done so much better in Poland. Now, Alexander, I'm very happy to be in this panel uh, for one additional reason being that Alexander used to be, uh, now I'm making a confession, uh, probably you don't know, my boss in the Council <laughs> of Europe. Mm. Because for four years, uh, he was the head of EPP, of the EPP group, uh, the largest, uh, the European People's Party uh, group representing uh, Poland. And uh, we have spent uh, a lot of time uh, together, first uh, lamenting the sorry state of Polish uh, politics. That was before the victory of Tusk uh, uh, in uh, the fall. And then lamenting the sorry state of uh, um, uh, Europe uh, after uh, Russia's invasion in uh, Ukraine. Um, we had a wonderful, wonderful uh, time and we did uh, a lot uh, uh, together and, I'm, uh, and I do think that one of the most positive developments uh, recently was the victory of the opposition in Poland. Poland is a very big country, it's the country that gives the tone to the rest of former Eastern Europe. It has done spectacularly well economically and we want it to do as well politically uh, as, uh, as well and back in the European mainstream because we have so much work uh, 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 together. Um, we, are, we, we have a very, very big challenge uh, in Greece in addressing the issue of uh, uh, legal uh, migration. Um, it is a new challenge. Um, until uh, the big economic crisis, uh, we had a, a nearby pool uh, satisfying our needs called Albania. Uh, uh, this is empty uh, right now. Uh, most Albanian countryside is, is as deserted as the rest of the Balkans. And uh, most of the people that had to, could immig immigrate uh, uh, immigrated to uh, Italy and uh, Greece. And now, uh, during the crisis, of course, a lot of Greeks left, including a lot of migrants. And now we need uh, uh, to uh, uh, rebuild uh, the mechanism almost from uh, uh, scratch. Uh, it's a very difficult process, but we are very ambitious, and by the end of the year, we will have it uh, up and uh, running. And in the meantime, we are taking all these uh, intermediary measures mm -hmm. to address these very acute uh, uh, labor shortages, especially in tourism construction and especially in uh, farming. So we have almost concluded those six bilateral uh, agreements. And uh, we are working with uh, uh, these governments uh, to uh, uh, bring people in. We want to involve IOM and uh, uh, the World Bank in facilitating uh, that uh, uh, mobility. And of course, uh, we want to, to invest on the integration side of uh, things with uh, Greek learning, uh, skilling, reskilling, upskilling, and um, all the other uh, measures. But more than uh, the legal, more than the administrative, it is the political battle uh, that is the most uh, important and that needs to be uh, waged on a, constant, uh, on a constant basis. Thank you, Mr. Karidis. And uh, this is a very nice segue to the, the question to you, um, Alexander, because Poland actually went through a process in which the country was a main immigration country, so a source of people leaving the country. But in the last years, actually, the country has received a lot of migrants. And this is even before the conflict in the, in the neighboring countries. 
So there are, in, uh, 2000, between 2018 and 2020, Poland has been the largest, um, the EU country with the largest number of temporary resi resident permit for third country nationals. This is something that many people don't know, but actually Poland is becoming a migration hub. And this is because of some uh, policy changes, the introduction of some new instrument, the simplified pr procedure for the employment of foreign workers that brought a lot of Ukrainians, people from Russia, Moldova, Georgia, um, Armenia, Moldova. And so in a way, the country has had experience in transitioning uh, from a status of immigration to a status of immigration, having, having also to integrate um, the different uh, workers. I understand that uh, what, me what the measure that was supposed to be temporary, only giving permit uh, to worker for six months, now it's become longer term. So the permit is up to two years. So I wanted to hear a bit from you, what are your suggestions, what are the lessons learned from Poland? Also for some EU countries like Croatia, they are experiencing this transition from immigration to immigration country. Uh, let me first uh, to thank <laughs> <laughs> Minister Kairidis uh, uh, for the kind words towards me. Uh, and I must stress that uh, the Greek delegation is one of the strongest <laughs> and, and uh, the, the very active uh, in uh, assembly, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. And the uh, second observation uh, that we are coming from uh, completely different countries, uh, different history, uh, but uh, what matters that we are from the same family, uh, political family, and uh, I have such a uh, the same approach that you took me half of my speech, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is uh, always uh, quite difficult. Uh, but uh, so let, let, let me uh, focus on the, as, as you asked me, uh, on the Polish uh, uh, history of migration, immigration. And let me start that uh, this is the migration is not only, maybe for you this is something what I should not say, but this is not only technical and economical problem. This is cultural, strongly political, and uh, also uh, the responsibility of uh, your society. And in Poland, what happened recently, it was something which is very difficult to understand. Only 10 years ago, only 10 years ago, I participated in uh, Denmark to one conference where the chief of trade unions uh, in Denmark, he accused the Polish legal, legal uh, migrants of uh, being uh, uh, such a threat to the Danish society that the Danish government should do something about this. Why? Because those migrants, they were working 12 hours instead of working only eight, etc., etc. So uh, we faced this, um, uh, this approach, uh, sometimes hostile approach, uh, from, uh, 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 from the hosting country. And suddenly, because of uh, our achievements, economical achievements, we switched suddenly from the country that there is no more migration. Uh, and suddenly, there is migrants coming to Poland. Why this is, for example, different from Albania, from Armenia, uh, from, uh, from Croatia? I strongly believe that uh, that stopped. <coughs> I mean, there is some people, but not workers, mm. as on the beginning it was, who want to, 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 to go to the countries where they are better paid. Now there is a high class, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, doctors, technicians. I remember also 10 years ago, uh, the conversation with some ambassadors in Poland. And the Ukrainian ambassador, he was, uh, uh, he was complaining, 
uh, you are taking the best people from our market. Mm. And then uh, I was complaining, okay, but in, in Great Britain, there is one million best people from Poland. Mm. And suddenly uh, the, 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 the Germans said, okay, but uh, Brits and, uh, and Americans, they are taking also the, uh, the best brains. So this is something natural which is happening all over the Europe. But there is this second uh, aspect, which I spoke about cultural and, uh, 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 and political. In the same time, when in Poland, that when Poland, Polish government, not mine, the previous one, was accused of pushbacks, of blocking people uh, coming from Belarus, of uh, 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 stopping them with children at the border. And it was absolutely uh, something like 80% uh, Mm, this government was backed by the society. The society said, yes, you should protect us from those people. In the same moment, Poland received three million refugees, the real refugees, from Ukraine. And this is the phenomenon that you can only explain by uh, the trust of your society the people living in your country, in decisions which are reasonable because this hybrid, hybrid war exists. And, uh, and somehow also uh, uh, Greece was uh, living the same uh, with much better. I must admit that you, uh, your reaction was much more open uh, to this migration. So, these aspects must be always taken under consideration that uh, more, uh, and one last uh, 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 thing, what happened uh, uh, those days, you said that uh, Poland recently, for the last years, was the country receiving the biggest number of uh, legal migrants. So the same people from exactly the same countries were stopped uh, when trying to cross, cross the, uh, the border illegally and they were admitted by the normal proceedings. So uh, we have to observe those rules, make make easier, and you spoke about this uh, uh, during the last panel, uh, you have to facilitate mm. the legal procedures, but on the other side, uh, to stop uh, the extremist, the xenophobe, you must also show that you are strict when somebody wants to come illegally to your country. I had uh, uh, this opportunity uh, something like uh, six years ago, uh, to speak to the king of Jordan. And that was the moment when Jordani received uh, one million uh, refugees from, uh, uh, from uh, Syria. Uh, and the whole population of Jordan is two million or something like this. So a huge number. And when we, uh, 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 when we spoke to the king, and saying, uh, it's amazing what you did. What he said, uh, it's, not, it's not like this. Because those people, this one million, they used to come for the last 10 years. They were coming for a week to work, and they were going back uh, after work uh, to, uh, to, to their home. One day, they, uh, they were deprived of, of uh, homes, they came and stayed, but they were integrated very, very uh, uh, easily. That would be my answer about the difference and why from time to time it works and why it doesn't. Thanks for sharing uh, this up, Alexander. 
And so, in a way, my main takeaway take so far is that there is not a fixed migration status the country has. They can be receiving countries or um, sending countries, depending on the underlying circumstances, being demographic change, be economic factor, but also experiencing conflict in nearby countries. And in all of this, the success of migration policies is not only in having the workers coming, but also in providing successful integration policies. So I think this is a very good insight to also mm -hmm. keep in mind for other um, European countries. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to talk um, with you, Pablo, about the, some of the findings that we're hearing, so, that we've been hearing so far resemble a lot what I think the World Development Report 2023 on migration produced by the World Bank also highlights. It's, it's interesting, at least for us, because when we go in a lot of countries, the World Bank is not necessarily known for the work that we do on migration. We'll go to countries and talk about poverty uh, eradication, health, education, so social protection jobs, energy, all the different sectors. But every time we get a bit of a surprise when we start talking about migration. And so in a way, we believe that the launch of the 2023 World Development Report represents a milestone for our engagement on migration. We're joining, we're joining a very good circle with colleagues like um, the one from IOM and other organizations. But this is an important point. So I think this is maybe a good opportunity, Pablo, to highlight a bit the messages of the World Development Report and also suggesting what are some of the solutions that the report highlights. So over to you, Pablo. Thank you very much. An honor to be here in Greece. An honor to be with champions on migration uh, sitting uh, side to side. No? Uh, you mentioned about the World Development Report. So for those who are not very familiar, every year among the thousands of publications that the bank uh, produces, there is always one that is among the king of all publications, which is the World Development Report. It's the, uh, the most uh, significant flagship that the institution produces, and every year is on a different topic, depending on what are the feelings of the sentiments that we see are high priority priorities for the world. And so it was telling that in 2023, it was chosen the report to be focusing on migrant refugees and societies. And, uh, and I think it's not uh, something arbitrary. We are at a moment where these topics need to be put on the table as critical because we are, in a way, and I will argue why I think it's the, this is the case, we are at a moment in, in terms of human mobility that similar to what we will be facing with climate change if we don't address it. But let me, let me elaborate a bit more. So um, basically the report talks about the, how crisis in general, but also better standards of living are the main motivation why people move from one country to the other. Um, aspirations of having a better, uh, a better standard of living. This is compounded by other shocks that people face economic crisis in certain countries, conflict, a natural disaster that will be exacerbated by climate change, technological disruption. We are at the moment also, in, in particular in this, part, in this moment, where all of that are coming at the same time. We call it, even at the institution, we call it polycrisis moment. Mm -hmm. um, this is a way that why we see a lot of movements. Um, now, there is a perception of a lot of people moving. Actually, it's not that many considering the state of the world today. It's only 3% of the, of the world population that are actually living in another country. And this the ratio has been more or less stable over the past decades. We're talking about 286 million people, of which 36 million are refugees. It's a very specific population. 250 million are migrating for econ what we call economic reasons. And, um, and of course, the report delves into, into these aspects and trying to understand not only how migration uh, is a reality and that possible uh, be increased in the coming decades given the uh, different demographic trajectories that we are seeing, but also that it can be a huge opportunity for countries. Uh, for origin countries, because migration is a, a skate ball for those who are seeking uh, for jobs that are kind of fine at home. They are sending remittances back home and this is to benefit in many of these countries. Uh, potentially, they are also returning home and they can bring skills and experience uh, acquired abroad. But also, more importantly, we need to see the coin from the destination countries. Destination countries can benefit a lot 
of course, for migrants that are a good fit for their labor market. And increasingly, what we are predicting is that that need from destination countries, if anything, is going to increase. And again, coming back to some of the figures that Mauro was, uh, was showing, I'm going to complement that. We have reached already as a world, in the world population, the peak in terms of uh, number of people. Uh, in, the, in the following decades, we're going to start seeing that the world population start declining because of the aging uh, profile that we are experiencing and low fertility rates. Uh, and a country like Philippines that two decades ago, the fertility rate was close to 6%. Uh, last, last measure last year was 1.9. Uh, sorry, six, six, uh, six children, 1.9 children uh, in the last measure that you have. So it's very significant and sharp demographic uh, transition, including on low fertility rate and, of course, high expectancy of living. Uh, Mauro mentioned one third of the world population and the, world, uh, and the workforce is going to be predicted to be in a continent like Africa in the coming decades, because that's the only continent that will continue to grow demographically. In a continent like Europe, one-fourth of the population it will be 65 years old or more. So we are uh, seeing these shifts are going to be, I think, dictating at the end of the day, and I agree with you, uh, uh, that it's not just economics, there are politics involved, but eventually the economic argument, at least that's what the institution we are looking at, are going to end up prevailing. Because, uh, Basically, there will be a global competition of talent. We are seeing already in your discourses, it's hard already to get qualified workers for filling labor shortages that are going to be, if anything, increasing the rich countries. What is the problem? That the continents that will continue to produce workers, they are, cannot do it alone, in particular in terms of skills. Mm -hmm. The trajectory of skilling up is really uh, very pain in a continent like Africa. So we will need to support them. So the World Development Report talks about, in particular, how we can only, not only uh, increase labor pathways, but also how the possibilities of investing in skills in the countries that are going to be producing the future labor force is important enough so that we can all benefit uh, in terms of their uh, skills, their contribution to the economy. And uh, I think my colleague uh, uh, here, uh, Fabio, will elaborate more. We are converging as a collectively in many organizations trying to support countries in schemes like what we call global skill partnerships. We basically try to seek win-win agreements between countries to provide worker, facilitate movement, and invest together in skills. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. So, Fabio. Pablo just said that it's not only about attracting workers, mm -hmm. but it's also about investing in skills in, uh, in the country where these workers are from. And 2023 was also an interesting year uh, when it comes to IOM work, because you, um, IOM published a report explaining what skills mobility, mobility partnerships are, mm -hmm. uh, how different countries can take advantage of this, and also giving a guide mm -hmm. to practitioners on mm -hmm. this com concept of skills mobility partnership. So if you can tell us a bit more on why skills mobility partnership would be superior in terms of outcomes to other agreements that we've seen around for a few years. So what is special about skills mobility partnership? And what are really skills mobility partnerships? Thank you for the question, Mauro. And first, let me thank the World Bank and also the Delphi Economic Forum for inviting me to participate in this, in this important discussion. As you, uh, as you already know, maybe you heard, uh, you heard uh, our DDG speaking before, uh, the IOM, since 1951, IOM uh, is the leading intergovernmental organization in the field of migration and is committed to the principle that um, humane and orderly migration benefits all, benefits migrants and benefits societies. We support migrants across the world uh, developing effective responses to, uh, to address the shifting dynamics of migration. We work in emergency situations, but we also enhance the capacities of governments and other stakeholders, including the private sector, uh, to manage all forms of mobility, particularly labor and skills mobility. Uh, earlier this year, we adopted a new strategic plan that includes three main themes or priorities. The first one is saving lives. For us, this uh, area of work represents two-thirds of our budget. 
the humanitarian work is very important to us. But also, uh, the second priority is driving solutions for displacement. Uh, the organization works uh, in, in facilitating solutions for uh, people on the move, for them uh, to be better prepared to get jobs and to engage and live uh, fully in the communities that, that, they, that they can find a place to live. But finally, the third main uh, priority is to facilitate and to establish regular pathways. And we are doing this because basically, and maybe we will agree on this, that irregular migration is on the rise, and also it's increasingly dangerous. Um, safe and regular uh, pathways, the minister already said that in the panel before, uh, to migrate for work are too few, are very limited, and in some cases are also inefficient. So, to respond that in response to that, we are working together with our, with our member states, but also with our uh, private sector counterparts to provide pathways to uh, get uh, to get into actual jobs. We are trying to train people before migrating so they can find better jobs in the countries of destination. And we are also uh, working with key industries to address the needs in terms of the skills, uh, the skilled workforce they need. Just to give you an example, 75% of 21 European countries uh, couldn't find the workers with the right skills, with the right skills they needed um, in 2023. So it's not just about having enough people, it's also about, about having the people with the right skills. I come from originally from Costa Rica and I was reading a couple of days ago that 75% of small and medium enterprises in Costa Rica will need workers with AI skills in the coming, in the coming days. And maybe this is the case also basically in, in everywhere. Another, another example is that, or another data is that in 2023, 54% uh, uh, of small and medium sized um, enterprises in the European Union reported that uh, finding um, employees with the right skills uh, was one of the most important difficulties they faced, according to Eurostat. So to address this, uh, Mauro, uh, we, to address this, we basically developed since 2019 what we call uh, skills mobility partnerships as a concrete solution to facilitate labor mobility pathways. The idea of SMPs basically is, uh, is based on the original idea of the global skills partnership that Michael Clemens and others developed in the Center for Global Development uh, around, around uh, 2012. What are SMPs? Well, basically, SMPs are an innovative solution uh, to promote skills development, skills matching, skills recognition, and skills, mo skills mobility at once. Um, under this model, the countries that can that participate could be two or more countries um, identified together. And let me emphasize this. This is something that must be done together. Uh, what are the key sectors that uh, need to develop the skilled workforce? What are the critical occupations that uh, they want to focus on? What is the best way to recognize the skills of these, of these workers? And how can they better match job seekers with uh, employment opportunities in both countries of origin and countries of destination? And maybe this is one of the most important differences between SMPs or GSPs and previous labor mobility schemes. Uh, priorities and the needs of the country of origin are absolutely similar or important as well as the country of destination. This is what is uh, famously known as the dual tract that characterizes SMPs. Just to conclude, Mauro, uh, let me say that um, what differentiates um, SMPs to previous labor mobility programs or, or schemes are, are, in my view, three main uh, factors. First, SMPs need to be designed and managed by different stakeholders, private and public. It is not just the responsibility of one single authority, one single, for example, ministry, uh, such as in, in previous examples or in the past in traditional labor mobility scheme. Second, um, under an SMP, um, you can address the needs of multiple industries. 
And also, you can benefit workers in different skills levels. Traditional labor mobility schemes basically um, address the need of one industry, agriculture, construction, IT, nurses, and in one specific skills level. Under SMPs, you can, you can integrate different skills levels for different industries. And third, this is probably, my, um, in my view, the most important feature of an SMP, is that um, SMPs can certainly help countries to address labor, labor shortages, but also, can, also countries can use SMPs to um, plan in advance what are the skills that they will need in the future. What are the skills, for example, Minister, that Greece will need in the next decade? So you can plan that in advance. You can partner with the countries to develop these skills and train these people to come to Greece and help you to address these needs. So it is a forward-looking approach that is different to uh, traditional labor mobility schemes. And just to conclude, uh, uh, I, would, I would like to say that probably one of the most important features is that to be successful, SMPs need to uh, be based on a multi-stakeholder approach, including the participation of private sector, civil society, different government agencies, to share and reduce together the costs associated with these schemes. This is how we expect that SMPs contribute to benefit all the parties involved. Thank you, Fabio. So what I'm hearing all of you panelists saying at this point is that migration has some unique complexities that require a coordinated approach. And this complexity, as the minister started, are about not only the economics aspect, also the social, political, and cultural aspect, the need for integration. So countries are not only admitting workers, they are admitting people. So what are the complexities related to the needs of people? And Pablo mentioned how different countries over time may have evolved, and the potential uh, strong uh, factor that economic um, the, the potential strong uh, impact economic factors will have. And now Fabio is just highlighting how a coordinated approach yeah. with different partners is needed. It's not only one agency, it's multiple government agencies, but also it's private sector, uh, the civil society. So this is all required for a successful approach. I think one partner that we haven't discussed explicitly is the international community. And mm. um, how can international organization really make the difference in this complex area? And on the one hand, I would be interested to hear from Fabio and Pablo what IOM and the World Bank would do, but also on the other side, what you uh, think that for your countries, the international community could do to maximize the benefits from migration. And I see that we are um, running out of time, so if you keep, uh, can keep your intervention two minutes, and maybe starting from Fabio, and then yep. the minister can give the concluding words. Thank you, Mario. I think this, this is a very important question. First, I think the first thing we need to do is to avoid imposing uh, governments or countries specific approaches uh, or models without knowing the real needs and the institutional capacities that um, all the parties uh, have uh, before doing anything. We need to understand these capacities. With this in mind, for example, we are, we are conducting feasibility studies uh, first, to make informed decisions about whether an SMP might be the best policy tool for a specific given context. Uh, we have found in some countries, particularly in Slovakia, remember, that maybe it was not the best tool uh, to what uh, they wanted to do at this moment. Uh, feasibility studies are critical to identify um, the key stakeholders, the real uh, needs from the private sector, and the actual capacities of the government and how rules and policies might facilitate the implementation of an SMP. And just to conclude, um, related to this, to this point, something that is very important for us is that we need to enhance the capacities of the governments before engaging in this type of um, SMPs or schemes. Um, it is not reasonable to expect that uh, a country or any country or government will do this uh, from one day to another. There is a learning process that needs to take place. And for doing that, IOM has developed a full, inter a full training package to support governments to understand what it takes to implement SMPs and how this can be done in a gradual manner. Thank you, Fabio. Pablo, over to you. Yes, uh, well, we all know, I mean, World Bank is an, is an institution that we really want to base our policies in data and knowledge 
And, and basically, one of the uh, main uh, aspects that we are looking is into not only just uh, documenting the potential transitions and, of course, the pathways that migrants may have, but also how we can start implementing as well these type of solutions. And we are partnering with a lot of institutions, including IOM, but also I want to mention others, no? the European Commission with the Talent Partnership Initiative. She, I said, they also have in, in Germany their, their model. Uh, it's called Triple Win Model. And we also have other actors uh, in the table trying to also work into how to promote talent and eventually as well promote the mobility. We at the World Bank, um, and, and I'm going to refer, we use the concept of global skill partnership, but as it shares all the similarities that what Fabio just mentioned. Basically, we want to start uh, supporting concretely uh, corridors of countries. We are having a target of this year in 2024 to support at least 10 global skill partnerships, basically how we can start connecting countries. We are still already doing, in the European Union, mm -hmm. we reached an agreement with Spain to start looking into this with three Latin American countries, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and Dominican Republic. We want this to span to more, to not only with Europe, but also with other uh, 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 regions in the world that are also in need for works. But one of the comparative advantages that we have is that we have a mandate of presence and, 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 a, and a, an objective to work with the poorest countries to help them develop. And one way we do that is to invest by investing in uh, substantively resources in training interventions. Most of these training interventions are so far mostly directed to cater the needs of the domestic labor market in those countries. There is a huge opportunity for us as well to engage with countries of destination in supporting that training process that is taking place in the countries of origin, trying to bring the standards that are going to be needed for, for them if they decide to, to go and explore in the global labor market, trying to align institutions, and also how to work as well on, on making this a, a, a practical solution. So um, we want to work with all the governments possible that are willing to, to do this. We don't, we're not pretending to do this alone. We're going to be working with partnership with other institutions. And, and we think it's the right moment to start investing, as I mentioned before. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. We can predict. And we are coming in Delphi, the city of the Oracle. We are trying to predict uh, what is going to look the labor market of the future. We more or less have some ideas, but we need to start investing today. because. Mm. Building systems takes a long time. Thank you. And Alexander, you have in front of you a representative from World Bank, representative from IOM. What can you tell them that you think they could do, the international community could do to uh, support migration? Let me migration? say that I am under, uh, uh, I'm really impressed uh, by uh, your provisions and what you are trying to do uh, to, to, uh, uh, to focus on those changes and how to react. Mm -hmm. even before something will happen. I'm a, a bit pessimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, only a few years ago, uh, it was uh, half of, uh, uh, of uh, Scandinavian and uh, Germans coming to uh, the Polish uh, beauty clinics, uh, beauty surgery. Mm -hmm. What happened in Poland, uh, just in three years, uh, that first of all, uh, the prices went so high because of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Westerns coming. And in the same time, it was the facilities for our doctors and nurses to go out. Mm. So with this shortage, the prices went up. What is right now, everybody is uh, uh, running to Turkey for the uh, beauty surgery. Uh, not only uh, from uh, Western Europe, but only from, uh, also from Poland. We, we can try uh, to understand the market, but uh, mm. the market uh, is uh, surprising us uh, so quickly that uh, I, I hope this is going to, to, uh, to, to help, but I'm a bit pessimistic. And, and as Fabio said, I think this is a pro the process of learning, understanding, yeah. and mm. scale up and only when mm -hmm. there are joint solutions that can be beneficial for orig origin and destination countries. So mm -hmm. I think this phase of learning and understanding is going to be mm -hmm. very important. Minister Kerry, these last words are for you. So what do you think what the role of the international community can be in the area of migration to support positive outcomes uh, for migration? Uh, I'm heading a ministry called Ministry of Migration and Asylum that was very recently established, actually, only the last five years. 
and it was born out of the refugee crisis, mm -hmm. and it was mostly focused on uh, the asylum side of things. As the Greek government was trying to take ownership from the international community of how to deal with the incoming refugees, because uh, initially it was the UNHCR, the internationals, the NGOs, uh, who were providing uh, for lack of uh, 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 state presence uh, in the field. Uh, more recently, we are trying to develop the migration side of uh, things, as I explained uh, before. And we have introduced a structured dialogue with all the stakeholders, which we didn't have before. First, uh, for the first time, we invited representatives of the migrant communities uh, uh, to the ministry. We have 700,000 legal migrants in Greece, 50,000 refugees, and 27,000 under temporary protection, mostly Ukrainian. So overall, mm. an 800,000 population who we want to feel that our ministry is their home and that we are here to uh, uh, resolve their uh, uh, problems and uh, to listen to their concern. And I think it is much appreciated uh, by them. Then we invited the NGOs, uh, not always uh, the easiest of partners, but who have contributed uh, a lot uh, uh, in the uh, past, S certainly some of them. And to uh, listen uh, from uh, the field, uh, the real uh, experiences. Um, we have established a task force with all the relevant ministries, because as you said, we uh, uh, invite workers, uh, but we get people, we get immigrants. Uh, and uh, immigrants have uh, certain uh, needs, uh, from family unification to education, eventually even to citizenship, uh, where other European countries have been much more forthcoming, like Germany, as you know, uh, recently. Uh, so we have this task force with all the relevant ministries, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Labor, in order to do away with all the bureaucratic hurdles in integrating people. So how they can get uh, faster a tax ID, how they can get faster their papers, how they can mm -hmm. register their mm -hmm. children to school, how they can have social security uh, benefits, and so on and so forth. And already we are proceeding quite uh, fast. We are also inviting the private sector, the producers, the farmers' association, uh, the industrialists' association to take ownership of this uh, uh, process and to move away from a certain model to a new one. In uh, the past, there was a lot of undocumented labor, black uh, market. Uh, we want to move away from that, to do everything legally, above the table, uh, with taxes, uh, with uh, social security contributions, and understanding something that it is difficult to understand uh, occasionally, especially if one reads the Greek press, the press in general, uh, that we are not doing these people a favor only, they are doing us a favor as well, and that we are uh, in all this together, and that there is an increased international competition for attracting this uh, mm -hmm. uh, labor. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that uh, 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 it's not uh, in the public uh, debate is the fact that the migration population of the country is decreasing rather than increasing. If you were to read much of the press, you would be under the impression that we are being flooded uh, by uh, uh, foreigners. This is not the case. We had a lot of foreigners living during the crisis and during COVID, and as a result, those labor shortages uh, have uh, increased uh, the most. We uh, operate under a particular disadvantage, which is that we are in Schengen and we have to compete with great magnets uh, such as Germany and uh, uh, the North. Obviously, we cannot provide the same benefits, we don't have the same state capacity, but we do need to realize that uh, old practices of, uh, uh, um, how should I put it? medieval conditions uh, uh, have no place in uh, today's uh, Greece and will uh, uh, do no more. So we really want the private sector, and we do find uh, good partners there uh, to help us in this uh, new age. And in all this uh, uh, um, uh, outreach, the internationals uh, have uh, a, a, a special 
uh, place uh, to play, be it the European Commission and the European Union where we belong. Obviously, all the international organizations like UNHCR, IOM, the World uh, Bank. They, I do also, in conclusion, have a piece of advice uh, uh, for them. Occasionally, they pontificate uh, from the safety, uh, from the liberal safety of uh, their head headquarters, mm. and they, are, they tend to be ideologically, uh, uh, how should I put it, arrogant, if not biased. Mm. They must realize that uh, uh, one has to be uh, realistic, mm. that uh, receiving societies have their own needs, anxieties, and uh, uh, demands that need to be uh, satisfied. And uh, it's not a uh, one-way street. It's a two-way mm -hmm. street um, uh, where uh, um, we need to convince uh, people this is the democratic game. It's uh, complicated. It's not always easy. It needs courage on our uh, side in order to uh, explain. The last uh, thing uh, we need is uh, um, uh, the abuse. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, some uh, um, Eurocrats and uh, others, and you know what uh, I mean. They have a lot of good advice to offer, and you should take advantage of that and make good use of that. I mean, those uh, numbers, for example, are very uh, important. Uh, but we also need to recognize the political context, constraints, uh, demands uh, uh, that we operate uh, with. And uh, so um, this matching uh, needs to come from, uh, uh, from both uh, sides. Absolutely. So Thank with this you. very encouraging words from Mr. Karidis, I would like to close the panel. Thanks for the participant for staying, and thanks to all the panelists for your contributions. Thank you.